Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the second installment of our Language and Identity Workshop Series. My name is Hannah dahlberg dodd Project Assistant Professor at Tokyo College, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to direct your attention to the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen. If you prefer to listen to today's lecture in Japanese, please feel free to select the Japanese button for live English to Japanese interpretation. The title of today's keynote lecture is Exploring the Changing Perceptions of Masculinity in Asia and Beyond Through the Lens of Sociolinguistics. It is my immense pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Mie Hiramoto. Dr. Hiramoto is an associate professor in the Department of English Language and Literature at the National University of Singapore. Her research interests are sociolinguistics and linguistic anthropology, in particular language, gender, and sexuality, as well as contact linguistics. Dr. Hiramoto has published widely on these topics, including some recent publications in Language and Society, Language and Communication, World Englishes, and International Journal of the Sociology of Language. She is currently writing different handbook chapters while working as one of the editors of the Oxford Handbook of the Japanese Language. Dr. Hiramoto also serves as co-editor-in-chief of Gender and Language, the associate editor for the Journal of Language and Sexuality, and an area editor for, editor for Linguistics Vanguard. For today's event, we will begin with a lecture by Dr. Hiramoto, after which I will open the floor for questions from the audience. One quick note for the audience, please use the Q&A functions provided the Zoom window below to send us your questions. Uh, and you can do that at any point during the lecture. You don't have to wait till the end. The webinar portion of today's events will be immediately followed by the workshop portion featuring four presentations on the topic of language and media. Please note that the two halves of the event have separate Zoom links. So if you have not yet registered for the workshop that begins at four, let's see, please click on the link in the chat that I am sending right now. And you can register there. All right, Dr. Hiramoto, the floor is yours. Hi. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. Um, let me share screen here. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the kind introduction again. I'd like to thank Dr. Hana Nalbakdo, Dr. Maria Teragina, Tokyo College, and the Language and Identity Workshop Series organizing team for inviting me to take this keynote address position. I'm also grateful for the fantastic interpretation team for this event. Thank you so much for making this possible for me. This presentation is rooted in my work thus far on media representations of gender ideologies, particularly concerning ideas of masculinities from a viewpoint of theoretical notions of mediation, mediatization. In um, something like, um, semiotics. Over the past decade, I have been investigating East Asian specific ideas about femininity and masculinity within a large, um, larger understanding of dominant and cross-cultural ideas about these concepts using data taken mainly from popular media, including novels, anime, and film, and some of the examples are coming from um, works on Sunrise's anime, um, Cowboy Bebop. And also I have uh, written some papers on um, Asian masculinity focusing on yeah, uh, Asian violence. This uh, is uh, a lot of them come from harmful uh, films, action films. Outline of today's talk, my presentation today will be organized in this order. Please be reminded that I will be sharing some data taken from popular media uh, productions, which include some violence. I will make sure to give you some trigger warnings. Yeah, um, but please be uh, uh, advised that my talk contains some something sexy too, some sexualization uh, um, under the discussion. Uh, of language and gender sexuality. I will be sure to announce yeah, uh, about these uh, sexualized contents too. Now, 
This is an introduction about media data in sociolinguistics. In contrast to research traditions that popularize the analysis of naturalistic data. In this presentation, I highlight the utility of media-based data as a tool with which we may explore ideologies regarding language, gender, and sexuality. Much like naturalistic data, mediated images are scripted discourses and they have the ability to convey embedded social meanings to that uh, listening audience. Crucially, however, the mass appeal of mainstream media grants it a unique ability to reinforce dichotomous models of essentialized ideology, such as men supposed to be like this, women supposed to be like this, and it's everywhere. You know, it's out of control. It's very interesting that at schools, at universities, we have been talking a lot about how not to hold on to this dichotomous, you know, that the framework, but outside world, we are surrounded by it. Also, we'll be um, talking about something about consequences of what these naturalizations do to our mind and how we use language. Ashif Agar's notion of enregistrement became vital in my work on mainstream media data. Media discourse, Agar suggests, plays a key role in determining how distinct form of speech comes to be um, socially recognized or enregistered as in this case of speaker attributes by a population of language users. It sounds a bit dense, but what he's saying is like, we make a judgment. So for example, we get into an elevator at the business building. Some people come in and start using a low um, jargon. And we kind of decide, oh, these people must be working for a, a law firm or they have some kind of a legal um, work. So their language is enregistered to be a, a speakers of um, people who are engaging with some kind of a um, yeah, um, law um, affiliation. In mediated discourses, enregistered meanings reflect institutionalized consensus of the social and cultural world within which they exist. So if we recognize some people to be belonging to the field of law, we may think, oh, these people are um, <laughs> highly professional or highly educated. So all these attached meanings, maybe they are wealthier than me as a people. So these attached meanings are being accumulated with our judgment we make based on their language use. Yeah, so this is like um, indexicality in some other linguistic anthropologists work. The combination of enregistrement with linguistic regimentation enables typecasting to function as a shorthand for social meanings. In promoting these imaginary figures who are typically um, easily imaginable for the viewers or consumers of the media. Um, language works very interestingly. Some um, earlier installation of Tokyo College's um, that language and identity workshops, scholars like uh, Professor Momoko Nakamura or um, Tomosada Sensei, they talked about this, uh, how specific um, Hogan or the regional dialects or social dialects can entail typecasting. So if you speak in certain ways, it's very easy for consumers to understand, oh, this character is supposed to be such and such. For example, um, mad scientist or some um, uh, daughter of a rich family. So these this are all relevant to the idea of enregistrement and uh, mediatization. Now, I'm going to connect these ideas with 
um, concept relevant to language and sexuality. So in short, my discussion tracks popular media constructions of masculinity and sexuality from the theoretical viewpoint, such as enlistment and social semiotics. Semiotics as in visual science inclusive. Furthermore, this line of research often employs concept of mediation and naturalization to illustrate two points as shown here. For example, in the following case studies, I will report that scripted performance of masculine characters such as James Bond from the James Bond series or um, Hollywood um, action films, Asian um, characters. So these people are highly constructed based on these um, ideas that we, we just discussed. Using Gramsci's defini uh, defining theory of cultural hegemony and normativity, hegemony may be understood as a kind of general consensus on how to interpret the world around us. He argues that this consensus of cultural hegemony emerges from negotiation between um, diverse ideological groups. Instead of being dedicated by I mean, dictated by a single dominant group. Similar to what Judith Butler says about performance and performativity, through repetition, these ideologies come to be accepted as given and eventually naturalized in collective consensus. In short, mainstream media are able to um, wield significantly more power in setting guidelines for naturalization, thus retaining um, legitimacy for their own ideologies. Furthermore, naturalization of gender ideologies by media can be inflicted along the vectors of language use, race, ethnicity, nationality, body types, gender, sexuality, and all these things. From here, I will be talking about how social linguistics can inform our understanding of popular media's relationship with changing notions of masculinity by focusing on cinematic portrayals of masculine features based on the James Bond franchise. This case study is based on my collaboration with um, uh, other scholars, Phoebe Poa um, and um, my PhD student, Vincent Park. When studying the notion of hegemony and masculinities, this segment of the presentation examines changing trends of media masculinities through the lens of social semiotics. Performance, affect, affective regime, in particular, we examine how idealized masculinity shifts over time through the scripted speech of James Bond films um, started in um, you know, uh, some you know, long time ago, like over 60 years of history, right? So James Bond figure back then, Sean Connery is a star. In latest James Bond, Daniel Craig, they show different types of masculine traits. And of course, they are motivated by the viewers, right? Because these film productions are um, doing production for commodification. So they are trying to produce things that will be more profitable. And different strategies are, in, strategies are incorporated in this commodification process, such as um, yeah, affect, affective regime. While affect can be conveyed through affect, affective signs that mark one's projections of emotions according to Lionel Wee, an affective regime refers to the set of conditions that govern with varying degrees of hegemonic status, the ways in which particular kinds of affect can be appropriately materialized. So affect is, for example, we see something from San Rio store, oh, so cute. So this, oh, I feel this is cute. And 
connect to happiness or, oh, I want to um, be nice. So th this kind of positive feelings are invoked from these uh, characters, for example. And affective regime actually um, talks about how institutions use this kind of uh, uh, evoking affect for um, different institutional practices, including commodification. So if you see a, a, a product with a cute character, the idea is that, oh, people behind the product want you to buy it because uh, you think it's cute. You know, very simply uh, condensed, the idea is like this about affective regime, yeah? So affective regime may be explicit or implicit about encouraging uh, connections between affective affective signs and people's interpretation. Keeping these theoretical points in mind, we looked at all James Bond characters in the currently available 25 James Bond films. Among them, we mainly focused on the first and the last Bond characters, yeah, namely Sean Connery and Daniel Craig, as their time span are the most distant. In we combine visual and sociolinguistic analysis to reveal how the masculinities of these characters are performed and naturalized with use of affective regimes of women and vulnerability. In this presentation, I'm gonna focus on vulnerability. So what do I mean by vulnerability? Um, the main analytical point here in James Bond character, um, The original Bond was represented as somebody who possesses quintessential masculine qualities. For example, scholars um, of film like uh, Hammerstein described Bond as a Superman in tuxedo. He was literally like that. He gets shot, but he can still run. <laughs> he gets, you know, uh, punched, but you know, he's invincible. So these are the area, um, the Bond image. He is not really vulnerable, right? So then um, this uh, trend went through from 1960s to yeah, 1980s, then James Bond characters, as it was passed on to other um, the actors, started showing different dimensions. And in uh, Pierce Brosnan's time, um, he started showing more vulnerability as in like he gets hurt and he shows the suffering um, unlike the earlier Bond characters, yeah? So he started showing more like um, the blood shedding or um, limping after being shot. So these kind of things. Now, um, naturalization in mass media goes with this idea of James Bond. Okay, so uh, he's very strong, you know, um, he's super capable. This was wanted, let's say, in 60s and 70s. But today's audience want to see people, uh, even as heroes, are uh, uh, showing some kind of a human nature. So vulnerability is one of them. So they expect the audience wants, what audience wants is, witnessing you know, what kind of person this character is. So more of that the personal baggage is put forward um, in typecasting. So yeah, Daniel Craig Bond became less of a Superman in Taxiro. Um, Bond played by Sean Connery does show some vulnerability, but very minimum compared to the modern James Bond characters. This um, picture is taken from Sandoval, 1965, and this is the only uh, image I could find uh, in Sean Connery's James Bond, where he is uh, showing the blood. So you see a, a um, little blood on his lip here. But um, today, this is from Casino Royale, um, first film that Daniel Craig take, took over. In this scene, he's naked and being tortured. Yeah, he's showing blood, he, he mourns, and he, he shows very visible suffering. 
So these are the contrasts in change of James Bond masculinity. It doesn't mean that Daniel Craig Bond is less masculine. He is still hyper masculine, but he shows all these different types of um, yeah, um, affective signs conveying specific affective regime to the viewers. I'm gonna move on and show a, a clip. The trigger warning here is the character here, James Bond's boss, her name is Emma, she dies here. Yeah. So if you don't want to see people dying, you may want to just uh, look away for one minute. I'm not going to play the sound, so you only see the vi vision, yeah? Okay, so here, what I'd like you to see is James Bond's um, um, display of vulnerability. So here uh, was one example from Skyfall, how Bond character cries. I have another example where somebody else dies. So this is James the Bond girl, uh, Vesper. Um, she dies. So again, if you don't want to watch a uh, person dying, uh, you may want to look away for yeah, uh, um, one minute or so. Yeah. Um, this is different from his uh, um, boss dying. This is the person that he fell in love with and he, he cares very much about her. Um, actually, she drowned already and he's trying to resurrect her. So I'm gonna play just a short segment. <laughs> So again, um, he he shows so much emotion compared to um, earlier Bond characters. So in summary, we'd like to note some unchanging qualities seen in James Bond before discussing some shifting trends in idealized James Bond masculinity, such as. Um, the playboy character, he's always uh, yeah, the babe magnet. And um, he's always very popular, but what has changed is he became somebody who honors true love um, in Daniel Craig installation. So he met this um, female character, Vespa. And unlike other James Bond characters earlier, he, he holds on to Vespa for one film after the other, right? So um, yeah, this kind of a uh, um, more of a monogamous, monogamous relationship um, started appealing uh, to audience. Now, unchanging masculine uh, qualities include, so this unbroken nature of sexual desirability, regardless of whether he's uh, yeah, um, having more than one partner or dedicated to, to uh, one person. So to conclude this case study about James Bond and changing masculine qualities, focusing on vulnerability, we found that the earlier Bond characters like Sean Connery somehow turned the changing situation around to um, their favor and managed to solve the problems after a minimum display of vulnerability. 
So in Thunderbolt, he, you know, James Bond, Sean Connery showed a little blood, but after that, he shows no physical damage whatsoever. He starts, you know, just, um, he was in, in a um, diving, scuba diving context. He puts on a diving suit and just start swimming right away. On the other hand, the new Bond played by Daniel Craig does demonstrate a strong sense of vulnerability. We suggest that an effective regime of vulnerability works to bring forth Bond's human behaviors and adds to his character developed by um, humanistic and holistic mas masculine male image. Once you think about this, I think it's happening in other action films too, like a Marvel um, series um, previously, Captain America, um, Hulk, um, this Iron Man, these people were just going out and fighting against bad guys. Even like Batman, you know, he's a bit different franchise, but so um, all these characters nowadays in films are showing more the human um, side. So it's gotta be a, uh, some kind of a shifting trend in projection of idealized masculinity. Now, I'm going to move on to the second case study, focusing on Anglophone cinematic portrayals of East Asian masculinity. Um, the case study too is based on data taken from popular action films featuring ninja, a specialized subtype of Japanese martial arts practitioner that has captured the Western imagination. This discussion tracks cinematic constructions of masculinity and sexuality from the theoretical viewpoint of social linguistics, linguistic anthropology and film semiotics. And is largely based on my collaboration work with Philippe Poir. I need to acknowledge her. I couldn't have done this without her. Um, based on multimodal analysis and notions of linguistic and visual enregistrement, this part of the presentation employs concepts of mediation and simulation to illustrate two points. The first one is a widely accepted martial arts typecasting of the ninja is a copy without an original in Hollywood production. And two, characteristics of heroic and villainous ninja characters are conven conventionalized via dominant discourses of hegemonic masculinity based on their race, namely whether it's a, a, an Asian character or a, a non-Asian character. On a theoretical point, in contemporary discourse, the notion of the shimulacra carries within it an air of futurism. Films such as The Matrix or Inception or well-known example uh, other than this are a Star Trek series where they ha have this uh, um, um, the simulation deck, holodeck um, stories. Yeah, so these are uh, uh, a very good um, film adaptation, a visual adaptation of um, Baudrillard's Shimulacra and Shimulacra, uh, Shimulation. I'll be explaining this as we go over the data. Baudrillard connects the notion of Shimulacra and Shimulation with the intervention um, of um, the map making, so not intervention, invention of uh, um, map making. So imperialist um, cartographical efforts, meaning that when military people are making maps, they are trying to strategize how to fight based on the model, the map, but it's not the real land. So this is like a simulation, right? You are simulating um, actual fighting strategies based on the model that looks like the original, but it's not the original. So that's the idea. Um, it can be adapted to film too. So what um, Phoebe Buana I would like to argue is that characters like ninja, we don't, I mean, <laughs> even know who, who ninjas are. I, I hear they existed, but they are very, 
mystical characters more than necessary. Uh, yeah, I guess, you know, um, any rate, um, especially outside of Japan. So these images are highly uh, um, commodifiable um, for people of all ages. So I mentioned the action film characters, right? It includes children's films or, you know, um, anime. So I'm sure you have seen some of these before, right? And adults also have been enjoying, um, yeah, uh, different types of hmm, media production based on this category. The popularity of ninja themed entertainment for all ages are still strong in Japan and also outside in Japan too, like in Hollywood. So they keep making uh, um, action films featuring like ninja type characters. Needless to say, many, if not all, versions of the ninja in contemporary Japanese media are fictionalized uh, iterations of the historical figure, such as um, Kirigakure Saizo, Hattori Kanzo, or uh, Sarutobi Sasuke, Ishikawa Goemon. We, we are all familiar with these names. So this is, again, in enregistrement. When we hear names like this, we yeah, uh, are stimulated to imagine, you know, um, these imag imaginary ninja characters, right? So on a po theoretical point, coming back to the contemporary discourse ideas um, related to something like Matrix or Inception, uh, the Star Trek, yeah? Um, um, Jim Baudrillard's Shimulacra and Simulation, which itself uh, is built on um, the, the understanding of something something imagined. So it's like a, a copy without the original, yeah? So here, um, this is actually the very first image of ninja in Hollywood films coming from 1967 James Bond film, coincidentally. Uh, you only live twice where uh, Tamba Tetsuro was featured. James Bond comes to Japan to fight um, espionage from Spectre. So, but this image kind of became a, a prototype of Hollywood ninja. So many ninja characters uh, after this film tend to have similar um, appearance. So the ninjas have shadowy talents um, and they, they can do some you know, uh, my mystical tricks and this romanticization um, somehow is connected to uh, recollection of bygone Japan epoch, Japan's past. Simply put, the ninja in the Hollywood cinema has become a a referent, an empty signifier of old world Japan after it's in this uh, prototype was established. Yeah, so this is exactly a copy with the original. I, I don't think Japanese people see this ninja and think, oh yeah, that's, that's our ninja. It's very different, right? So while this curious phenomena is certainly uh, um, Criterion in positioning Hollywood ninja films as a shimirakram, it does not yet fully represent the dissonance between the Hollywood ninja and its historical equivalent. The racial politics is compounded on um, this as it is no longer possible to assume that the ninja in Hollywood cinema is Japanese. There's non-Japanese, non-Asian ninjas in Hollywood films, right? The result of this complex enregistrement of national history, race, and masculinity is that it is an ongoing site of con um, contestation for hegemonic masculinities. Yeah. Um, so it's it's it has the Hollywood film has become a a site for um, 
contemporary racial geopolitics. So you can decide, oh, if it's uh, an American white ninja, it's usually a hero. But if it's a Japanese character, it's either a sidekick character or a villain, yeah? Um, I'm going to um, show you an example here. Again, here's no sound, but I want to show you is how romanticization is at work in this naturalization of ninja in Hollywood films. Here you see a back of sensei, ninja master, um, living somewhere in Japan. And he has this ninja dojo. Some of his uh, uh, students are non-Japanese. And um, he has this yoroibitsu or a secret weapon chest. And he says, these uh, uh, weapons have been kept uh, for centuries within his family, which sounds highly unlikely. But let me show you uh, briefly the partially of this uh, video. Again, there's no sound, but you may see somebody being shot with like shuriken. So if you don't want to see the violence, yeah, uh, please look away for about a minute. Are you right? Sacred chest. So a typical way of romanticizing ninja in Hollywood films can be observed in this opening scene, how he opened this weapons and he's explaining the history of his family weapon. Each piece with its own story. So then he says each piece has its own story and it was passed down to generation to generation. Created for one purpose only. The purpose of the weapons were to start a violent death. So, uh, if you know uh, Naruto or Ninja Hattori Kun, you may say this is Shuriken. So, it's highly unlikely, I said, because if, that means you know, if we're going to pick up these weapons after the fight and washed and polished and put it back again. I don't know if it happened or not, but this is what Hollywood film tells us. So we looked at uh, selected films and as you can see in um, some of the names, they are color coded. Red is uh, Japanese characters and blue are uh, American characters. Um, as you can see, some of the names do not sound really Japanese, but sound somewhat Japanese like this uh, Kenoichiro Harada or Gobei, maybe Gohei, but Gobei. And there's like Oroku Saki, uh, it's uh, the villain from the, the Ninja Taros. But anyway, so this kind of, uh, uh, some kind of Japanese Japanification is going on. I'm going to show you a, uh, um, this is the Teenage um, Mutant, Teenage Mutant Ninja Taros. Um, as I speak, I'm gonna play the clip and you can see how these turtles are not really mapped on Japanese. Ayo, sorry. So the Ninja turtles are riding So here, um, uh, yeah, my uh, co-research and I categorize them as an American. So they, they are not even human, but um, Raphael, Michelangelo, Donatello, and Leonardo, they, these are the mutant ninja characters who were born in not United States, and they grew up as an American. So um, their behaviors are very different from Japanese ninjas in Hollywood films. They eat pizza, they speak in like use jargon of the time. So these uh, um, masking traits shown in 
Hollywood ninja characters. Yeah, they are highly uh, uh, based on masculinity hayaki discussed by people like uh, Cornell. So usually um, it goes with body size or that the power um, in a society, hegemonic power. Usually it's the white people, black people, Latino people, Asians come at the very bottom, um, maybe because of the body size or the minority status, um, according to this Western model. You know, Asian model doesn't really you know, follow this Western model, and that was the whole purpose of the study, right? So coming back to the idea of Shimirakura, why is it a, a copy without original? So all these ninja films feature ninja dojo or ninja school. I don't really know any ninja schools outside of Kyoto Uzumasa, Egamura, or somewhere like that, right? So it's, it's, I've seen many karate dojo, aikido dojo, a kendo dojo in Japan, but ninja dojo, if you know, please let me know. I, I, um, it's naturalized, yeah? So then here, um, American heroism is added into Hollywood white male ninja, meaning that usually Asian characters fight for their school, their sensei, or their brothers. They do not really fight for their women or family. In Hollywood ninja films, Japanese characters do not really fight for their girlfriends or you know lover, but um, white ninja they do. So that's one thing that was noticeable. So they go uh, uh, on their own, like lone wolf kind of a path, with an endorsement of their teacher. It's not really the case only for um, so-called like serious dramas, it's a case with a comedy too. So here, um, Haru, the white ninja character and his sensei, yeah, Haru says he wants to go and find this woman and sensei <laughs> goes against it first, but then he actually, uh, um, yeah, uh, endorses Haru's decision. So Haru grew up in Japan, goes to Beaverly Hills to find this woman to save her. So another character here is um, the re more recent film, um, Casey from Ninja Shadow of Tear. Here, he went against his uh, school's rule to go and save a woman. Yeah. So coming back very quickly to the findings of um, white characters found in Hollywood ninja films, they are different. In our observation, um, they behave more like canonical American heroes in action films, like Lethal Weapon, Die Hard, this kind of a, uh, um, rebellious heroic characters. Right. Whereas Japanese characters are either the sidekick or a, a, a villain. And they don't really have any anything you know, romantic with a, a female character. Now, I'm going to move on to my last case study here. This is taken from Singapore. So if you're not familiar with the idea of fitspo, um, this is a, a fitness um, uh, in a, mm, more of a showcasing manner. So this uh, group of men that my student, um, Yanin, Yanin Lai and I followed, they are showcasing their muscles for commodification. Yeah, so they put their pictures in Instagram and they get the sponsorship, right? And they do uh, personal training business. So um, it's, it's a, a male self-objectification. They objectify their body for commodification through social media. It's a very new phenomenon, actually. 
So this rise of male objectification, um, yeah, uh, is happening all over the place, not just in Singapore. And masculinity and sexuality, yeah. Uh, usually it was more of a, a female objectification and female sexualization for commodification. But now, yeah, um, men are doing it to themselves. Uh, it, it must be uh, quite profitable if many people are doing this. We did this study almost 10 years ago and we see more and more uh, um, fitful influencers in Instagram and uh, TikTok as, as online platforms. So here, um, the masculinity can be enacted through manifestation of sexuality. So sexual bodies for men uh, uh, being more, um, mm, becoming more dominant in uh, um, discourses of masculinity. And many studies earlier on were done based on Western framework again, like, you know, yeah, the most prominent person being Cornell again. I'm only citing her, the original book, but there's a you know, second edition, the newer publications by her. On the topic of um, masculinities, shifting ideologies, but yeah, her focus is mainly on uh, Western culture, which I'm, I don't have any programs. I'm just saying that, yeah, uh, we have our own um, domain. Um, looking at Asian context, and that's what I'm doing here. With the rise of social media, men's bodies have also increasingly begun to be displayed on media platforms like Instagram, as seen in the recent development of online fitness uh, communities. So propagating images associated with fit and inspirational often circulates under hashtags such as fitspo, sometimes um, sponosexual, so these are, um, yeah, um, ideal men in, yeah, today's society. Very different from ideal men in Chinese tradition, where you are training for um, practical purpose, for fighting, not to show off your body. So that was that the reason why we decided to follow Chinese um, Singaporeans to see how um, hmm, the trends are changing. So today, male bodies have become a form of symbolic capital. And um, somebody like Baudu says that, that the human body is a, a bearer of a symbolic value. Yeah, so there's a value to the body, right? So sponosexual sports like sexuality, um, coined by Andrew Simpson, uh, who also coined the term um, metrosexual. So it's a, a different type of modern masculinity. And as I explained with Aga's um, model of enregistrement, yeah, um, these people can be highly noticeable with specific enregistrement tokens. So four fits for inference as we followed are Daniel, JC, Levi, and Willow, they're also the names, right? So I'm going to, um, I'm aware of the time. So I'm going to go, you, uh, go and show you some of the data. Here, we investigated how Instagram fits for people project their bodies. Self-objectification, this is not cropped. This is what they posted on their own without their faces. This is self-objectification, right? They are only doing this to show off their body. And when they have their faces, you can see they use this license to withdraw according to government model of gender advertisement. So when you're looking away, that's license to withdraw, you give audience room to scrutinize their bodies. Ritualization of subordination is where uh, people in images are showing um, unstable body positions. And feminine touches when people in images are not showing a strong grip, but like light, light touch. And Goffman used this to distinguish male and female. But we can use this to distinguish yeah, um, male influencers here. 
So license to withdraw, they all do it to, uh, I guess, give room for audience to inspect their bodies. A lot of people gave different comments. Um, based on our investigations, we came to understand that, yeah, out of four physical influences, two are um, not straight and two are straight. And these um, descriptions of um, like comments, they're all very popular. They say um, very positive things. When no straight influencers receive um, sexualized comments, they don't deny it. They implicitly accept it. And yeah, uh, they don't say things like, don't do this. Whereas straight, influencer, um, they, they didn't want to accept this. So anyway, quickly summarizing, it's a very dense study. Um, what we found in the um, investigation of Singapore tweets for Instagram data is that um, they used strategies to sell their own bodies for commodification purposes. They naturalized the fit bodies and um, self eroticization is also uh, highly mm, noticeable whether influencers are, are straight or not straight. Yeah, so um, they are self, self objectifying their bodies to all, all audience, but it was only the straight influencers who explicitly denied. Um, comments that came from men um, about, yeah, that sexualizing their bodies. So, um, coming back to, this is the last uh, pe penultimate slide I have, overall conclusion of investigating shifting ideologies of masculinity, as William Weave discussed, how relationship between language and gender are mutually influenced by the content and context of late modernity. So now we are in today's modernity. It may change, you know, 50 years from now, but we can see that, Chi you know, Chinese uh, um, people in Singapore uh, conforming to like more of a westernized ideas of um, showing off bodies, things are changing. And it's not a bad thing. Yeah, so language and sexuality, we have to observe um, as something fluid. We keep talking about, we need to move on from dichotomous relationship of um, gender and sexuality in relevant, in, in um, uh, concerning, let's say, um, what masculinity are, what, what masculinities are, and what fem femininities are. It's not the question that we want to um, study, right? We want to study who uses it when and how, regardless of these uh, preconceived notions of, oh, you are a woman, so you should be like this. So we want to get away from this. And I hope to have shown how this, uh, investigations of shifting ideologies of masculinity can contribute to understanding the fluidity of um, our yeah um, naturalization naturalized ideas. So what's what we believe to be natural actually is not static. Yeah. So that was all I had to say. Thank you very much for your uh, time and uh, patience. I'm sorry. Um, Professor Hana, I may have uh, gone a bit over, but I hope you forgive me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hidamoto, for that insight into changing representations of masculinity and the way that language and media influence our perceptions of those representations. And time-wise, you did just fine. That's <laughs> no problems. Um, next, we'll open the floor for a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, we already have one in the chat, actually, from Antonia Guardado, who asks, um, in reference to the the vulnerability, the kind of the the change in vulnerability that James Bond undergoes. Um, he asks, do you find any similarities in vulnerability in your research on kung fu movies? Ah, 
Thank you, Antonio san. Thank you for your question. This is a very interesting point, right? Um, Kafu films are showing vulnerabilities uh, with some characters. Usually, the younger characters, yeah, they want to keep the, this is typecasting, right? So they need, they, they are still are uh, uh, fixed roles given to different characters in, let's say, Kung Fu films, right? The vulnerable ones, vulnerable ones tend to be younger and they are like questioning about their past, but usually <laughs> they come back and say, oh, no, I cannot change. I have to pursue what my teacher says. So um, it's, it's, yeah, it, yeah, it's there, but I haven't really seen a big change. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I also have a question actually, um, kind of talking about James Bond again and how you know his, his masculinity has changed over time. Do you think that there's a point at which kind of like if there's some sort of required level or required type of masculinity for James Bond to have to be James Bond? Like, is there a point when he stops being James Bond or do you think he can just continue to evolve in whatever whatever shape he ends up taking on? So um, that's also a very interesting point, right? So, I mean, James Bond franchise is very special in a way that it has a huge fan fandom. So um, some, when Daniel Craig came in after Pierce Brosnan as a new James Bond, there's a www, Daniel Craig, not for James Bond .com. <laughs> So people are complaining that why he is the James Bond and this and that, because he's blonde and you know he, his body type is different. But after he took on, oh, people loved him. So I think it, he, they did a very good job marketizing the film. I think it, also shows how he showed his like hu hu human nature. So it, it's a combination. So he still slept around with other women, but he had this like, you know, designated lover, I think that appealed to people. Yeah. So, so after this is a question, right? Can he be known as somebody other than James Bond if he wants to keep that? Korea and I think he's doing a good job with this uh, like a glass onion right so he has new yeah uh, detective role that's already starting yeah thank you for the question I hope I, I answered you correctly yes actually um and actually I kind of wanted to build on that question <laughs> um because there had been some discourse around James Bond being played by a, a female actress, yeah. right? Um, what kind of, how, how do you think that would change James Bond's masculinity, right? If it were, if James Bond were played by a woman? Wow, that's a very interesting question. I hope they will um, feature, uh, uh, yeah, they should feature a female. It's, he died, right? In that, I'm sorry, spoiler, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. So in the last film, yeah, James Bond, <laughs> dies so 007 the code can be given to anybody else so they left the room i like to see it goes to a, a minority character yeah it, you know it would be great if it's a, a woman it would be great if it's a non-binary person right or a transgender person yeah i hope you they'll, they'll do something yeah innovative like that and I hope to see them being treated as a the ultimate hero. Yes, I love the idea of a non-binary James Bond. <laughs> that speaks to me. <laughs> All right, since it is four o'clock, um, I would like to close the first half of today's um, event. And I would like to once again, thank Dr. Hidamoto for her insightful lecture. Next, we will be moving to the workshop portion of the event. If you have registered, you'll find the Zoom link in your email, and I will see you there shortly. Um, if you will not be attending the workshop, I would like to thank you again for joining us today. You can find the latest information on Tokyo College through our website, mail magazine, and social media. So please stay tuned and keep an eye out for future events. Thank you very much. Thank you.